Hello everybody, Tim Tools 99 here. Hey, I had a request from one of my subscribers to show some of my images that I've been able to produce from the Bullfrog Observatory. And so here you go. This is just kind of a, a quick sample of uh, what I've been up to the last, oh, three or three or four years, I guess it's been now. Okay, everybody, here we go. In this video, I'll show you some of the pictures I took of the moon, galaxies, planets, star clusters, and nebula. When I got my new refractor telescope, the little 80 millimeter telescope, I spent the first year taking pictures of the moon. I've always been fascinated by the moon. I did some reading and found out that the Canon camera is highly recommended for astrophotography so I bought a DSLR, I used one, and I began to take snapshot style uh, pictures of the moon. Now I had always used 35 millimeter camera and so the DSLR was fairly new, especially Canon cameras, I had never owned one before and uh, so I spent that first year uh, learning how to use that camera and what exposures to use, and using it in manual mode and so on. And uh, then I began to shoot some video. And this was, of course, uh, just on a regular tripod. At that point in time, I hadn't even considered uh, any kind of go-to computer mount or anything. And so I'll, that, that first year or two, I was actually having a lot of fun with just that little telescope and uh, bought a few lenses and and just went out under the nighttime skies, di different locations, and took my little 80 millimeter te telescope and had a lot of fun. You know, they say um, the best telescope to buy is the one that you're going to use the most. And that's one thing about this, this nice little 80 millimeter telescope. You can take it anywhere. I think one reason that the moon is so special to me is that I can remember when I was just a kid back in the 1950s, I would help my grandfather carry his homemade reflector telescope out into the backyard and we would look at the moon. And he would tell me all about the moon. So I have great memories from back then. So I really enjoyed uh, my time with this little 80 millimeter telescope and that Canon camera. Well, in my second year of retirement here with the telescopes, I uh, decided to purchase a Schmitz Cassegrain nine and a quarter inch telescope with a go-to computerized mount. And that's when I learned about uh, shooting AVI video and then stacking the individual frames to make a composite image. And that's what these images are here. My grandfather just would not believe what is possible nowadays for the backyard astronomer. But here we are. It's a great time to be an amateur astronomer, that's for sure. Well, and then I went on, I bought a moon globe and I began to identify features on the moon and label some of my pictures. And you can see in this one where the Apollo 11 and 12 landed. So it was just great fun learning more about the moon. Now in 2015, September 27th, we had a lunar eclipse and uh, went out, took the telescope out and captured that blood moon. That was a lot of fun. Next I decided to take a series of pictures to uh, show the different phases of the moon. And so I plan to put these pictures in a frame when I get it all done, I still haven't finished this little project. I guess I better get back with that. <laughs> I still have to take a picture of the waning crescent moon. And then I kind of wrap things up one night with this spectacular image right here. <laughs> and then the deep sky adventures began and I decided that I wanted to take pictures of galaxies. And of course, we live in the Milky Way galaxy, and uh, there's billions of galaxies in the universe. 
And uh, I started out with the Andromeda galaxy because that's, that's our closest neighbor. But there's spiral galaxies, the elliptical galaxies, and the irregular galaxies. Now make no mistake, there was quite a learning curve for me for all of this. Learning to use the telescope mount and uh, to use a capture program on the computer to take these uh, long exposures and then stack them to make the final composite images. So all of these images so far are of spiral galaxies and you can see where they got their name. Now when I decide about my uh, imaging target of the evening, I like to read about the particular object and uh, for example this M94 is referred to as the cat's eye galaxy and um, this part of the Virgo supercluster of galaxies. There's just all kinds of things to learn as we go along here uh, doing this imaging. Now M100 is a beautiful example of a spiral galaxy and it's one of the brightest and, and biggest galaxies in the Virgo cluster. So there are plenty of targets in the night sky here that are within reach of the amateur astronomer with uh, just modest uh, telescope equipment. Now this is M49. This is a good example of an elliptical galaxy and it was the first one I believe that was discovered by Charles Messier. This is the Sculptor Galaxy. It's an irregular galaxy. This is my favorite here. The Sombrero Galaxy. Cool, eh? So it turns out that planetary imaging is a pretty difficult proposition. In a way, the uh, deep sky imaging is easier. Uh, at least I found it to be that way. I use my little 80 millimeter refractor telescope and it has a wide field of view and uh, it's a fast telescope at f6 and so when I when I collect that light I do that by uh, taking long exposures and as long as you have uh, a good mount that can track those objects um, you can take uh, the, the better the mount and the better you have it set up the longer the exposures you can take and the more light you can collect for the deep sky um, when shooting uh, planetary imaging, uh, if you use that little telescope, that little 80 millimeter t telescope, you'll find out that the, uh, the planets are very small. And so in your eyepiece or on your camera, that planet will appear very, very small with that telescope. So I soon learned that I needed a telescope with a long focal length. And I bought a schmidt cassegrain telescope. Uh, and uh, the reason you want that long focal length is uh, it will show a narrower patch of the sky which is ideal for for viewing small objects and the longer your focal length the greater the mag magnification you can get with that telescope and so uh, shooting at f10 I think I, yeah f10 on that telescope and uh, with that long focal length the planets appear larger in the eyepiece or in the camera that's that's the basics of the deal and so uh, I found that uh, with that big telescope my biggest issue was focusing if you're slightly out of focus it doesn't matter what processing you use you can't correct that so I've got a lot to learn when it comes to planetary imaging and I've only just begun so here's here's a few of my results that I've gotten so far uh, taking pictures of the planets. So my first night out there uh, trying to get a picture of Jupiter I was amazed because I could see that great red spot. So this is the picture I got there. Then on another night that turned out like that. I, I still enjoy these wide field views. This is through the 80 millimeter telescope. There's everybody's favorite target, uh, Saturn. And to date, I think that's my best Saturn picture. And there's Mars. Now, talking about the planets and our place in the solar system and so on, it makes you uh, 
learn a lot about what's going on up there and what we can see and what we can't see. So if this picture here represents our Milky Way galaxy from Earth, all that we can see, all the stars in the skies we can see are in this little yellow circle. So it makes me realize how vast the universe is if all that we can see is in this little yellow dot right there. Next, let's talk about star clusters. And back to the little 80 millimeter telescope. And this is the Pleiades, my favorite star cluster. You can see this with the naked eye, by the way. But through a small telescope, it is beautiful. And this is a, a globular cluster of stars, M5. Just a mass of stars. M13, another globular cluster. And this is M6, the butterfly cluster. Can you see that butterfly right there? When I began my astrophotography adventure, I never would have realized that taking pictures of nebula would turn out to be so much fun. And for that, we use the little 80 millimeter refractor telescope and we take long exposures. And for this, of course, we need the uh, tracking mount, that computerized mount that will stay focused on that object. And the better mount that you have and, and so on, the longer exposures you can take. Now, when you look at a nebula through a telescope, you basically see a, a faint patch of light, and it's in black and white. By taking these long exposures and then stacking those images, you can come out with a single image that will bring out the color in that nebula that's caused by the gases that, are, that, are, that make up that nebula. And so this is where the art of... Uh, photography comes into the situation because I like to process my images just enough to bring out those colors but not so much that they look like a cartoon so they look like they're they can't be real and so uh, it, this is this is um, uh, there's a lot of leeway that's given to the amateur astronomer for that final image let's put it that way so here's some of my images of nebula, and uh, some of them are really quite beautiful. And of course, if you want to see some incredible images, you go on, on the computer and look at what the Hubble telescope has been able to produce. But to me, we go back to it's still so amazing that the backyard astronomer can, uh, can produce these kind of images right here. Here we go. Now, as I mentioned, a nebula is a cloud of dust and gas in space. It's either, either visible as an emission or a reflection nebula. And also they have what they call a dark nebula, which is an irregular dark region against a brighter background. So let's look at some of my images of nebula. This is the M8, or the Lagoon Nebula. This is the Great Orion Nebula. The Dumbbell Nebula, you can see where that get, gets its name. This is a famous star forming nebula, M17. The Trifid Nebula is, is an amazing nebula. Here we go, this is the Trifid Nebula here. Would you believe that this stuff is up there? Okay, and this one is the Iris Nebula. Next, we have the Ring Nebula. Some nebula come from gas and dust thrown out by exploding stars, such as supernova. Other nebula are uh, regions where new stars are being born. The nebulas are star nurseries. Another thing I tried to do one time was take a picture of the International Space Station. So I sat there and followed that thing across the sky and snap the shutter. This is proof that that International Space Station exists because I've taken a picture of it. In fact, I took several pictures. Here we go. You can see the uh, solar panels right there on that one. And of course, as this thing is flying across the sky, it's moving right along pretty fast. and You have to uh, 
hold that telescope and look up through uh, the, the finder sight and try to keep that thing within the field of view. And when you think you've got it in there, you, you click the uh, shutter release. So I tried to take as many as I could as that space station was flying overhead. And there it is going out of sight the other direction. Here's a little picture that I put together. It's a composite image of, of several of those images that I took. Makes it look like the space station is flying right towards us. So that was a lot of fun that night too. Now before we end, I want to talk to you about light pollution. Where I live is about right here. And uh, the nearest really nice dark skies would be in Cherry Springs State Park down in Pennsylvania. But we have to do everything we can to uh, mitigate this light pollution that we produce around the world. We want to keep these dark skies so we can see things like the Orion constellation right there. And there you go. You look for those three stars in a row right there. This is the first constellation I learned as a boy. And there's these four corner stars. Over here is the, the bow. And then, of course, the Great Orion Nebula, which you can see with the naked eye, is right there. So there you go, everybody. I appreciate you watching and uh, subscribing and leaving comments on the channel. I've had a lot of fun doing these videos, and I've met a lot of good people. So thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.